Hello again everyone, uh, this is Adam and today we are going to be going over our next section of epidemiology and biostatistics. This is going to be the supplement to lecture four. Uh, this is a little exercise in which we are going to use some examples to better illustrate how we use p-values and how they can be interpreted uh, when looking at the medical literature. Very frequently in the medical literature, you'll see research questions posed as uh, there being some sort of difference between groups. And in class today, when we were talking about that body uh, temperature example, um, we were talking about how samples, how they were comparing to this, uh, this hypothetical um, population mean, that 37 degrees centigrade. And again, in a lot of cases, you're not going to know what the population average actually is, because uh, again, we just don't have that sort of data. And you could see even against a, a certain population uh, mean, you could see that the samples uh, could potentially be statistically significantly different uh, between uh, the, the sample data and the population data. In a lot of cases, you're going to be seeing this more expressed as differences between groups. So in this case here, we're going to be looking at the application of IV nitrates uh, and seeing if that has any sort of ability to reduce mortality. Uh, in this case, you'd see that the most appropriate study design would be a randomized controlled trial. Again, patients are randomized uh, to either receiving uh, the drug or receiving nothing. Those you know, patients getting nothing would be the control patients. And then um, the next thing we're going to be doing is looking at uh, interpreting the results of that study uh, once the results have been published. So as we know about hypothesis testing, any observed difference between the two groups could be due to the actual treatment, which would be a rejection of the null hypothesis, or could be simply due to random chance. And again, that would be a, uh, uh, we're gonna keep the null hypothesis at that point. Um, again, the null hypothesis for this example would be that the, uh, the administration of intravenous nitrates has no effect on mortality in patients with acute myocardial infarction. And so basically what we're going to be doing with this hypothesis testing is exploring how likely it is that the observed difference would be seen by chance alone if the null hypothesis, hypothesis were true. So these are going to be the six trials that we're going to be uh, looking at and comparing uh, and contrasting to one another. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this would be frequently how uh, a lot of data could be coalesced into something called a meta-analysis. And sometimes you'll see that in the literature, especially with, um, there's an organization called the Cochrane uh, Institute, uh, where basically what they actually do is they, they perform meta-analyses uh, for different uh, clinical questions. So you actually, in a meta-analysis, will take multiple uh, sources of information, normally multiple publications, and will compare and contrast um, those different studies in order to give you an idea of um, whether or not a, uh, a certain you know, treatment is, is going to be beneficial, whether or not a certain test is going to be um, useful, uh, all kinds of different things that they'll answer questions for. So if you ever see a Cochrane review, that's typically a, a version of a meta-analysis performed by a certain group. So the first study we're going to be looking at will be this uh, Cheech trial, or Cheek, however you say their name. Uh, and essentially what we're seeing is here that 50 patients were randomly assigned to either receive intravenous nitrates or were assigned to the control group. You can see here the groups are pretty evenly uh, divided between 50 patients in one and 45 in the other. Um, uh, while it was ideal to have equal numbers in each group, uh, you'll see very frequently in the literature that that's not always going to be possible. It's not necessarily a problem, it's just something that you want the groups to at least be somewhat even. Um, at the end of the follow-up, they saw that in the intravenous nitrate group, three of the 50 patients uh, had died versus eight in the control group. And so the next thing we're going to be doing is looking at the odds ratio. Uh, and basically an odds ratio are uh, looking at the odds of an event happening versus um, it not happening. So in the case of intravenous nitrates, the way that you would uh, calculate that would be to take three uh, which is the, the actual rate uh, of the event occurring, uh, death occurring in this case, and you would divide that by 47, or the number of cases where the event did not occur. Uh, same thing for the control group. And then once you have your odds of the event happening, you divide that out to get the odds ratio. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, we'll talk more about this in detail later on in the class, but just realize um, this is going to be one of those examples where if the 95% confidence interval crosses one, because again, the, uh, the baseline odds uh, is going to be one in the control group. And then you'd see here that in this example, um, that the odds ratio is 0.33, meaning that you're about a third as likely to have uh, death occur if you were to receive intravenous nitrates. And so then looking at the 95% confidence interval, we can see that it ranges anywhere between 0.09 all the way to 1.13. And then we see that based on that, because it crosses one, we immediately know that these results are not statistically significant. Uh, 
even though it looks like you have a pretty good uh, reduction in the odds of having death. Um, but in, the, in that p-value is backing that up by uh, being 0.08. Um, and again, 0.05 is going to be our standard uh, alpha level uh, to achieve significance. So if you're to look at the, uh, the group of the studies altogether, you see that five of the six trials uh, summarizes having the odds ratios that are pretty consistent with having a protective effect. Uh, in this case, it would be any odds ratio that is less than one would consider to be somewhat protective, um, but when receiving intravenous nitrates. And so you can see that based on the study, you have pretty wide range of, uh, of odds ratios, so, um, or risk reductions in this case, where you could have you know, anywhere uh, between 17% in the uh, Flaherty study, all the way up to 76% in the Busman study. So basically what that's saying is if you look at the Busman study in the odds ratio of 0.24, you're about a quarter of, as likely to uh, uh, experience death if you were to receive IV nitrates as you were if you uh, received NOAA nitrates. Okay, so that's you know pretty pretty decent uh, risk reduction there. Um, and then uh, the one last trial, the sixth trial, the Jaffe one, um, actually had an odds ratio of 2.04. Now that would actually suggest that receiving nitrates actually doubled your odds or doubled your risk of developing death uh, upon receiving IV nitrates. So it's one of the kind of the, the big outliers for that group uh, because the odds ratio is so much different uh, in that group than the others, which again will lead us to ask some uh, important questions about how these studies were performed. So again, the p-values uh, shown in the final column are really just gonna be showing us how likely it is that the differences we're seeing uh, between the nitrate group and the control group is simply due to chance. So going back to this Cheech trial, um, the p-value there is going to be, uh, even though the odds ratio is looks like it's protective being 0.33, you can see that uh, we're not gonna be able to reject the null hypothesis because the p-value does not achieve significance. And again, looking at the confidence intervals, this is also gonna be, uh, expressed here as well because we're crossing that one boundary. So because the confidence interval contains a value of one, we can automatically uh, rule out the null hypothesis. And so in another way to put this, looking at this non-significant result, we can see that uh, essentially if you were to carry out this trial a hundred times, uh, you'd see that uh, basically eight out of a hundred uh, times you would end up having at least an odds ratio of 0.33 uh, or more just by chance alone. So because of that we say this is you know just too likely to be due to chance um, and we simply cannot take these results uh, and reject the null hypothesis. So if you were to see data like this, if you just took the, the study by itself, uh, you probably wouldn't change your clinical practice. Uh, you basically just say well we can't say for sure that whether nitrates are going to reduce mortality and acute myocardial infarction. There simply isn't enough data to show us that it does. Now, if you were to look at the Busman trial and compare that to the, the Cheech trial, you can see here that uh, here they do show that odds ratio of 0.24, meaning your quarter is likely to die if you receive IV nitrates as the control group, uh, control patients in this group. And they had a p-value of 0.01. And again, that would be statistically significant since it's less than 0.05. And the confidence interval also bears this out because you notice that it ranges from 0.08 to 0.74 and does not encompass one. So basically what they're saying here is that if you were to carry out this trial again 100 more times, uh, there would only be one in 100 that would actually have an odds ratio of at least 0.24 or more extreme just by chance alone. Uh, so because this is a smaller probability, um, the chances of making a type 1 error in this case are pretty low. Um, and so we can go ahead and, and take that data and say, okay, well, there may be something here. Let's go ahead and reject the null hypothesis uh, and say that in this case, the intravenous nitrates was associated with uh, a lower odds of death compared to receiving nothing. Now looking at just one trial that shows a clinically significant result um, is all well and good, but usually it's not gonna be enough to actually change clinical practice, especially when you look at the actual number of patients they're treating. Um, you can see here that in the control group, they had 29 patients and, and 31 in the, in the uh, experimental group. And so typically uh, you're gonna need a lot bigger numbers in order to really say whether or not um, that the, the treatment is really gonna have uh, true effect there, uh, mainly because it's hard to generalize, you know, uh, around 60 patients out to all patients who are having myocardial infarction. Um, you also don't know much about the inclusion criteria for these studies. You don't know what type of patients specifically they're looking at. Um, so again, the generalizability of a single study like this without having all the knowledge is it, pretty limited. Um, so again, you can say that, yes, we could reject the null hypothesis in this case, but you may not be able to get a ton of clinical significance out of it um, unless you have some more context.
And then to compare that to the Flaherty trial, um, there they had a p-value of 0.7. Uh, and so even though the observed odds ratio of 0.83 uh, was looking to be protective, um, having a p-value of 0.7 means that you know, you're know you 70% uh, likely that these results are just due to chance alone. So again, that would be uh, the inability to uh, reject the null hypothesis since the p-value would be so high in that case. So comparing these p-values across the different trials, there are kind of two main features of interest to look at here. The first one uh, being that the size of the p-value is oftentimes related to some extent to the size of the trial, um, and in this context also the, the uh, proportion of deaths that were occurring. Um, but essentially, if you were to kind of compare the LIST trial and the drug trial, um, you can look to see that the, the second has basically uh, roughly twice the number of participants in the study. Um, and if you were to compare the p-values, uh, even though the odds ratios are very similar, you know, 0.56 and 0.48, so roughly, you know, a halving of the odds of, of death occurring with nitrates, um, you can see that uh, in the, the drug debt trial that the p-value is much, much smaller. Um, so a value of 0 0.007, which we would consider to be statistically significant, we could uh, go ahead and, and uh, reject the null hypothesis. As compared to the LIST trial, uh, had fewer patients, uh, and even though it showed similar results, the p-value was much larger. The confidence interval was much wider. You can see here it uh, encompasses one, uh, and thus it has a p-value 0.29, and so would be considered to not be statistically significant. Um, and so you tend to see the, the same pattern, uh, generally apparent in general, where larger studies will give rise to smaller p-values. The other thing that you're going to notice when you're comparing p-values across different trials is the fact that the, the effect size uh, or the change in, in between the two groups um, will affect how the p-values come up. So for instance here, you have the Cheech and the Flaherty trials that have pretty similar numbers of patients. Um, but if you look at the actual effect size, you see that the Cheech trial had a much larger reduction in risk of, of death in myocardial infarction than the Flaherty trial. And as such, even though they have a similar number of patients, the effect is much larger in the Cheech trial, and thus the p-value was much lower, so 0 0.08 compared to 0.7. Now, keep in mind, you know, the, the Cheech trial was still not significant, um, but just keep in mind that because that effect was much larger, you had a similar number of patients, um, the p-value is going to get lower because, it, again, it's just much more, um, much less likely due to the chance alone that you would get an effect size that large. So again, this pattern tends to hold in general that the more extreme effects correspond to smaller p-values. And again, we're going to be looking at the confidence intervals, and so seeing uh, very wide confidence intervals uh, makes it more difficult to achieve significance, and also has you know some clinical implications. Um, so, for example, if you're looking at this Cheech trial again here with an odds ratio of 0.33, um, you know that would suggest that the effects of IV nitrates would be to reduce mortality by about two thirds. Um, however, if you're to look at the ranges of the confidence interval, and again, that's the 95% confidence interval, or 95% of the true value should, should reside within that range, you can see that it could be anywhere between a 91% reduction uh, in mortality or an increase in 13% in mortality. Um, so you could have very substantial reduction in mortality uh, due to IV nitrates, although you could ha also have increase in mortality. So. Um, you know, it's it, you can't really take anything away from those kind of results because one, they're not statistically significant, um, and then clinically, you don't necessarily want to give something that you think may have a chance to increase mortality for your patients. Typically, a uh, pretty bad practice. Now, if you compare this to the Busman study, where their confidence interval range from 0.08 to 0.74, um, you know, indicates it could have a reduction in mortality, maybe as little as 26%, all the way up to 92% reduction in mortality, which again are much better, uh, much better results than we saw in the the previous trial. Um, again, there's no real suggestion here that giving IV nitrates would actually be harmful to our patients. Um, and again, because this does not encompass one, um, we see that uh, that our, this does achieve statistical significance and that the p-value is low enough that you know only one in a hundred trials would actually have a probability of finding this just by chance alone. Um, so again, uh, results like this and only 60 patients would not be enough to necessarily change clinical practice, but taken as a whole compared with multiple, multiple trials that show similar results, then you're starting to make some progress to actually making some changes in, in actual uh, practice.
So again, uh, the overview of those trials uh, you know, was carried out because a lot of the results did not appear to be consistent. You saw some things that were conflicting. And so uh, frequently individual trials um, are generally too small to really provide reliable estimates of effect. You know, unless you have something that uh, includes thousands of patients, it's very difficult to really say uh, definitively whether uh, some sort of uh, intervention or treatment is really going to be uh, having significant effects. So very frequently you'll see pulled analyses or these meta-analyses of the data um, where they'll compare multiple trials that have very similar um, interventions and very similar patient populations. Um, and, and you can review those and kind of take all the information together to have a better idea or a more robust estimate uh, uh, the actual effect that the intervention is going to have. So what we can do when comparing these multiple trials together is we can start to plot them on a, on a uh, box and, and line graph. Uh, you'll see uh, that the odds ratio is a 95% confidence interval uh, for the individual trials are going to be shown on the next figure in the next slide. And that the odds ratios for each trial is going to be represented by a box. The size of the box is going to be proportional to the amount of actual statistical information available for that estimate. I um, mean, more patients, uh, bigger trial, you're going to have a bigger box. And that the 95% confidence interval is going to be indicated by the horizontal line that you'll see. And basically, the solid vertical line indicates the odds ratio of 1, otherwise the line of no effect. So again, if the confidence interval is going to be crossing 1, that will be considered to be a non-significant trial. And then you can combine all the odds ratios from all six trials uh, and then actually combine that into one uh, with its own 95% confidence interval to get a better idea of, by pooling all the data, what is actually happening. So here, looking at the different studies, you can see um, how they kind of size up to one another. You can see the confidence intervals. Notice how we said that the Cheech uh, study um, was not statistically significant. You can see how it crosses that one line. Um, you can see the Jaffe trial, which actually sh uh, showed potentially some harm in, in giving uh, IV nitrates. Uh, and you can see as the size of the box increases, meaning that there's more patients involved, the, the N is larger, you see those confidence intervals start to shrink. So obviously the drug debt trial um, having the smallest confidence intervals associated with that. And at the very bottom you have uh, basically Basically, the, the dotted, uh, dotted vertical line is going to be the pooled analysis uh, uh, odds ratio. Uh, and then you have the, the diamond there kind of uh, showing the confidence interval. So you can see that because that does not cross one, this would be a statistically significant reduction in mortality. So again, uh, as we said, the pooled analysis resulted in an overall estimated odds ratio of 0.53, with a confidence interval ranging from 0.36 to 0.75. So that would suggest that the mortality reduction would be somewhere between one quarter and two thirds reduction uh, versus receiving no IV nitrates. Um, then examination of the confidence intervals from uh, the individual studies show a pretty good degree of overlap with one another. So it kind of leads you to think that, yeah, the results tend to be somewhat consistent uh, based on that. And again, even though that you did have like the Jaffe study, which was you know suggested to be harmful, even when combining it all together, you see that um, the data is still um, pretty consistent with one another. And then when you actually did the p-value for that pooled analysis, it ended up being 0 0.0002, indicating it's very very unlikely the chance alone could have caused these results to have occurred in the first place. So uh, basically since that time frame, um, since the time the meta-analysis was reported, uh, they actually had a big change in the, in the treatment of acute myocardial infarction, uh, especially since the, the introduction of thrombolysis. Um, and so what they actually found is that when they did a, uh, this ISIS-4 study, um, which actually randomized over 58,000 patients with a suspected acute myocardial infarction, they actually found no evidence to suggest that mortality was reduced by give, being given uh, oral nitrate. So again, not one-to-one -one with the, the, what we saw um, with the IV nitrates being given, um, but again, we now know, uh, especially with you know newer, um, you know, more emphasis on going to the cath lab and things like that, um, that uh, IV nitrates really are not uh, associated with decreased mortality. Um, so again, that's why they've really been relegated more towards uh, you know reducing the actual symptoms of chest pain and also for blood pressure control. So again, all of these things change with time. Uh, even though studies may show that you know such and such intervention is overwhelmingly positive. As things change, as the gold standards change, you can see that those results may be uh, basically rendered um, irrelevant, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road. So anywho, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to post them or to email me and I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks so much for listening.